Well, I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 2. I want to bring a message that would be called a Christmas message, and I want to turn our hearts to this to help you enjoy the season and all of the meaning of Christmas that we share together. I want to preach this day from the actual Christmas story itself from Luke chapter 2, which would be verses 1 through 7. The title of this message is, From the Throne to the Trough, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. In this account of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to draw your attention to something that might easily miss your focus. I want you to note the downward progression in status from those who are mentioned in verse 1 that descends down through the passage until we come to verse 7. This is recorded intentionally by Luke as a literary device to provide a contrast in greatness In the eyes of the world in verse 1, and that which would be easily passed over by the world in verse 7. This story is really like an upside-down triangle or pyramid with the powerful at the top in verse 1 and the seemingly weakest at the bottom in verse 7. The story begins with the single most powerful man in the known world in verse 1. The first ruler over the entire empire, Caesar Augustus. He sits at the pentacle of the political, military, and social structure of the world. That's in verse 1. Then working down, there is a second character to to whom we are introduced, Quirinius. He is the governor of Syria. He is a little lower in the social ladder under Caesar, being under his authority and under his dominion, yet he is nevertheless a man of power and prestige. Then as our eye follows down through these verses, far lower in verse 4 is Joseph. He is just a common man, a hard-working man from Nazareth in Galilee, an entirely unknown individual living in perhaps the most despised city in all of Galilee. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? And after that, still lower in verse 5 is Mary. And Mary is an unmarried woman with child. That is looked down upon in the day. And finally, at the very end of the story, in verse 7, is the birth of a baby. The lowest possible point in weakness and dependence. Here is Jesus, just an infant, laying in the feeding trough for animals, the poorest of the poor. And what I want us to see is this account starts with the highest worldly at the highest worldly point with Caesar Augustus and descends down to the lowest possible point from a human perspective with the birth of an infant. 
the stark contrast is intended. Uh, on this night, Caesar would have been sleeping in Rome on a golden bed under sheets of fine linen, surrounded by servants, protected by praetorian guards, served by legions of Roman soldiers ready to march at his command, and by total contrast. There could not be a greater contrast. The baby Jesus, wrapped in swaddling clothes, placed in a manger, attended by animals, I say the contrast could not have been any greater. Yet the history of the world and the eternal destiny of everyone in the human race depends not upon the mightiest man in verse 1, it depends upon the Lord Jesus Christ who lays in a feeding trough in Bethlehem. How differently we see the world once we know the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at these five characters. Caesar Augustus, verse 1, Quirinius, verse 2, Joseph, verse 4, Mary, verse 5, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 7. Let's begin in verse 1 with the sovereign Caesar. The Christmas story actually begins at the throne of the Roman Empire, at the summit of all world power, in the eternal city, Rome, with Caesar Augustus. We read in verse 1, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. His real name is Gavius Octavius. Caesar Augustus is a title. Those are two titles joined together that communicate the, the unrivaled power that he possesses. Caesar means emperor. It's a title. It's like president, king. And Augustus means the revered one, the highly esteemed one. In fact, the month August is named after this very man, Caesar Augustus. And August means inspiring worship and inspiring reverence. This was the title that was given to this man in 27 B.C. when the Roman Senate confirmed upon him the title Augustus, the August One. And with it he assumed absolute power over the Roman Empire, which was the mightiest empire on the earth, and there was entrusted to him immense wealth and the total control of the Roman army. His ascension to the throne marked the beginning of the Roman Empire as it was to become, with all of its power centralized in one individual. He was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, you recognize that name. And when his adopt, or as an adopted son, when his father was assassinated, after several years, he eventually assumed this throne. And there have been untold number of books that have been written regarding Caesar Augustus and the dominant place that he served as the beginning of the Roman Empire and all of its power entrusted to one single man. He, was, he rose to power as a ruthless man. Once in power, he somewhat mellowed. He was a wise administrator, a famous organizer, especially of his military forces, and his bodyguards, which came to be known as the Praetorian Guards. They are mentioned in Philippians 1. He chose his generals wisely. He won many battles and conquered foes. He brilliantly initiated Pax Romana, which means the peace of Rome, after he conquered a province and annexed it into the empire. He allowed them to continue to live in peace as long as they lived in submission under his tyranny. He stimulated the arts. He encouraged good literature. He was a, br a great builder, a strong leader. He ruled over the Roman Empire for over four decades. 
He sat upon the throne for 41 long years and, and ushered in unparalleled prosperity and peace through his strength. He accepted for himself the title Pontifex Maximus, which means highest priest. And as such, he was the head of all religion in Rome, even building a temple to himself for his own honor and his own veneration. Caesar Augustus was one of the mightiest men in all of human history. We read in verse 1 that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. This was a royal edict. This was a sovereign decree that this potentate made from his throne. And whatever Caesar Augustus decreed would come to pass. Whatever he decreed, armies would move, people would be transported. Things began to happen whenever Caesar Augustus decreed anything. This is where the Christmas story begins with the supreme Caesar. Caesar Augustus was like so many people today who are self-made individuals who rise to power, push themselves to the top, and live without God, and become a law unto themselves, and create their own standards for life. Such people today, like Caesar Augustus, look to themselves they live for themselves. Well, they may be benevolent and kind on the outside and promote some good in general for society, but the fact is they are their own little God. They understand that life is from them and through them and to them. They live for the praise of others. They live for the promotion of themselves. They rise to the top of their profession or their calling, and they have no time for God. They are too busy for God. They have no place for God. I wonder if you know anyone like this. I wonder if you work with someone like this. I wonder if there is someone in your family like this. I wonder if this could refer even to you. Second, I want you to note not only the supreme Caesar, but second, the powerful Quirinius in verse 2. After the mention of Caesar Augustus at the very apex of the political order, the story now moves down to the next step, the next rung, to Quirinius, who is governor of Syria. Verse 2, this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Syria. Luke mentions this to, to help us determine the date of the birth of Christ. Uh, Jesus was not born in the year zero. Uh, Jesus was born in the year of this first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. What makes this a little challenging is Quirinius served two terms as governor of Syria. One after the birth of Christ, and that's mentioned in Acts chapter 5, verse 37. And here, his first stint as governor of Syria. He served in that capacity from 6 to 4 B.C. From the year 6 B.C. to the year 4 B.C. And, and this historical fact helps us determine the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, which scholars tell us would be sometime late in the year 6 B.C. or early in the year 5 B.C. As governor of Syria, Quirinius was invested with much power. He was under the central authority of Caesar, who presided in Rome, and Quirinius had a delegated authority that came down from the throne in Rome, which put him into power over the province of Syria. 
he maintained this powerful position as long as he could maintain order among the people. As long as he could collect taxes and maintain order and there be no revolution or, or uprising, then he would stay in power and be enabled to keep his place. But if there did erupt any trouble for Quirinius in Syria that would grow and fester out of control, then Quirinius would answer directly to Caesar and no doubt lose his power, if not lose his head. Quirinius marks the second step in this downward descent from the single most powerful individual in the known world, now down to this governor over an entire province. Quirinius also is like many today, people who rise to power over others, yet depend upon, depend for their power upon one who is over them. Like Quirinius, they have power as long as they perform in their position. Such people have a delegated power from the one over them. Therefore, they live not to please God. They live to please their boss. They live, they live to please their board. They live to please their stockholders. In this trap, they live without faith in God. They live without the recognition that all that they have is from God. They live simply for the things of this world and exist only for the power of this world. Now, the world today is full of Quiriniuses, successful people who have no time for God and have no thought of God. And yet it was Jesus who would say, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? As we continue in this descent through this passage from Caesar Augustus, verse 1, to Quirinius, verse 2, we come now third to the obscure Joseph in verses 3 through 4. We continue to make our descent downward from the top of the world order, and we come a long way down now to Joseph, beginning in verse 3. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each in his own city. Obviously, when Caesar Augustus issued this decree, it was non-negotiable. It demanded immediate compliance. If there could have been any delay, Joseph and Mary would have delayed until after the baby had been born. It was so pressing and so urgent upon every person who lived here in, in Palestine, in Israel, under Roman Pax Romana, that even now as a pregnant woman, as Mary was, this necessitated that Joseph and Mary would act promptly and would act immediately. There would be no exceptions to their going to Bethlehem. So verse 3, everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. The purpose of the census was twofold. One, there needed to be a record of everyone living down in the Middle East, one, in order for taxes, so that they would know who is living there and to be able to shake them from their owed taxes to Rome. Second, in order for the military consignment in order to enlist young men, there needed to be this census. And yet, it is God who used this census, according to His own sovereign pleasure, to move Joseph and Mary from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, because it was the prophet Micah, in Micah 5, verse 2, who said that the Messiah would be born not in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem. And so God now sovereignly acts upon the heart of Caesar Augustus so that he would issue a decree 
so that Joseph would be moved from where he was in Nazareth to where he must be in Bethlehem in order to fulfill prophecy. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. As rivers of water, he channels it, whichever way he wills. Every human heart is in the hand of Almighty God. And for God to channel that heart according to his own sovereign purposes. That is precisely what is taking place behind the scene here. John MacArthur comments in his commentary at this point, God providentially arranged the world, setting to get Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem so that his son would be born where the Old Testament predicted he would be, as he had with Artaxerxes in Ezra 7 and Tiglath-Pileser in Isaiah 10 and Cyrus in Isaiah 50. God directed the mind of the most powerful man on earth, Caesar Augustus, to accomplish God's own sovereign purposes. Close quote. I like that quote. The decree that was issued by Caesar Augustus was the result of the decree that was issued by the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and the Caesar of Caesars, and the governor of governors, Almighty God in heaven. Let's look carefully at Joseph here, because the gap from Caesar Augustus and Quirinius down now to Joseph in verse 4 is an extraordinary expanse. In Luke 2, and in verse 4, we read, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth. The contrast, again, could not be any greater. Joseph is placed in stark contrast, in graphic juxta, juxtaposition from these two political leaders in verses 1 and 2. Joseph was just an ordinary man. He was a common man, a man who worked with his hands, a carpenter, hardworking, unknown to the rich and famous, cloaked with obscurity. Joseph, though, was, by every indication, a true believer in God, a man who lived by faith in God a man who accepted the Word of God as the authority of his life. And the way he responds to the message of the angel gives evidence of his true saving faith in God. Adding to his obscurity, Joseph himself being barely even mentioned in the Bible, added to this obscurity is where he lives. He went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth. And Nazareth is located some 75 miles north of Jerusalem. Nazareth, it says the city of Nazareth. It really wasn't a city by modern definitions of a city. Uh, Nazareth was a small village. It was a tiny little bump in the road. It was a tiny little hamlet, uh, an insignificant town that is not even mentioned in the Old Testament, nor is it even mentioned in other uh, writings of the day. Not once is Nazareth even in, in the record of the Talmud or the, the Midrash, nor any other contemporary Gentile writings of the day. If it, if it was not for this record, here in Luke 2 and a few other places, we would not even know of Nazareth. Uh, it was a town also looked down upon by those not only who lived in Judea in the south, but even in Galilee. Their neighbors, everyone looked down upon anyone who lived in Nazareth. In fact, in John 1 verse 46 would come 
this refrain, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth. It's a town of losers. It's a town of leftovers. It's a, it's a town of nobodies. It's a city with a social stigma. It was a place that was ridiculed and, and scorned and for apparently good reason. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The word good there speaks of moral goodness. It, it was an unrighteous place. It was an immoral place. It, it was a place where vice and sin had established a, a beachhead. C can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The answer is there hasn't been in a long time. It was a relatively hick town with a bad name because of its low morals. It was off the beaten path. It was not on any of the major trade routes. No one ever intentionally went to Nazareth. You had to be lost to end up in Nazareth. All important roads bypassed it. It was far away from the important centers of Jewish religion and, and any culture and, and commerce. It, Nazareth was to put it frankly, nowheresville. It was, we would say, the other side of the tracks where nothing good comes. Yet, this is where God chose to raise up His servant who would be the father of His Son, not directly, for Christ was born of a virgin, yet nevertheless to be the guiding influence in the formative years of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though unknown in that day, and still a, a, a veil of, of an enigma is shredded or shrouded over Joseph, he nevertheless was like so many today whom God uses in an extraordinary way that no one else ever hears about. Joseph, like those whom God uses, was a true believer, a God-fearing man, hardworking. Those are the kind of people whom God uses in his employ. Not those who are pushing for the spotlight, but those who are looking and pushing to be a servant. By this we are reminded of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world. And the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that He may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. God has always been pleased to reach down to those whom everyone else has passed over, to lay His hand upon the Josephs of this world in order to use them to confound the Caesar Augustuses of this world. One other thing worth noting to you in verse 4 before we move on is the verb went up. Notice, Joseph also went up from Galilee. Now, Galilee is to the north. He'll be going to Bethlehem, which is to the south, really five miles away from Jerusalem. When I was in Jerusalem, some of the men that I was with, we, we stayed in Jerusalem and and they would jog to Bethlehem in the morning and turn around and jog back. It's that close. But notice, went up. 
Galilee is in the north, Bethlehem is in the south, it sh should seemingly read went down from north to south. But it says he went up, and it speaks of the topography, the ascent upwards uh, into the mountains. Bethlehem lies on a mountain over 2,600 feet high. It's, e it's higher than even Jerusalem, which is Mount Zion. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea is not very far away. And so the ascent up to 2,654 feet where Bethlehem is, is a rather steep ascent upward. And so as Joseph and Mary make this pilgrimage to the town of their ancestry, because they are in the line of David, it was an arduous trip. It was a demanding and difficult trip. And it says something of Joseph that just because a task was hard and difficult did not stop him from putting his shoulder to that plow. Seventy miles uphill was this trip with a, with a woman who is with child. And yet Joseph gave himself to do what was right in this situation. It is the Josephs of this world, the unsung heroes in the body of Christ, who serve behind the scenes, whose place of ministry is unseen by the many, and yet who are the key links in the purposes of God moving forward. And perhaps if you're a Joseph here today, please know how strategic you are to the advancement of the causes of God here upon the earth. Number four, I want you to see the scorned Mary. As we continue to, to slide downward in this passage, it's, it's really an argument from the world's perspective, from the greater to the lesser. And of course, when we come to the end, we will invert this. And from God's perspective, it is the total opposite. For God sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And so, as we come to verse 5, this is now the fourth key figure for us to see in this text. And according to the values of this day, this woman with child out of wedlock was the scorned Mary. In verse 5, the sentence actually continues that began in verse 4, but we read, "...in order to register along with Mary." who was engaged to him. Matthew's gospel says she was betrothed to him. Luke says she was engaged to him, and they really mean the same thing. Matthew writes to a Jewish audience. Luke writes to a Gentile audience. And according to the Jewish culture, of which they were a part, they were betrothed, which means there was a contractual agreement, though they had not consummated their their relationship with a physical intimacy. But according to the Gentile mind, this means, well, you're engaged. And so Luke writes this so that the Gentiles' reading of this account would understand the trauma. This is not a married woman. This is, in essence, a, a fiancé, a fiancé, who was engaged to him and was with child. Mary was a lowly young girl, probably a young teenager, also living in this forsaken town of Nazareth. She is engaged to Joseph, who is also unknown, she herself unknown, and it's like like attracting like. They are equally yoked together. She is removed from the gazing eye of the influential people of the world. She probably has never traveled out of this little tiny area where she was probably born and grew up. And this 
lowly young woman, though, is whom God chose to work through to bring his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world. She was a believer, a genuine true believer. Reading Luke 1 makes that very apparent. She is saturated with Scripture. In the Magnificat, in Luke 1, 46 to 55, there are so many Old Testament quotations that just come flowing out of her mouth that she is, as Charles Spurgeon said of John Bunyan, she is a walking Bible. Cut her anywhere and she bleeds bibline. There are at least a minimum of 15 Old Testament quotations as she quotes prolifically from the Psalms and, and quotes from 1 Samuel 2 in the prayer of, of Hannah. She is saturated with Scripture. She is pursuing holiness. She is a virgin. As she will not cave in to temptation. She will maintain a standard of, of righteousness and, and purity for her life. Even though she lives in the midst of, of this town, can any good thing come out of Nazareth as she is surrounded by moral debauchery? She nevertheless has remained unstained and unblemished and has kept her purity. That is why she is a vessel fit to be used by the Master. She is humble before God. She is available to God. She has surrendered to God's will. She is sincere. She is genuine. She is authentic. She is passionate for God. This was Mary. Redemptive history hinges not with Caesar Augustus. It hinges with these two unknown teenagers, Joseph and Mary. We read in verse 6, while they were there, while Joseph and Mary were there in Bethlehem, the days were completed for her to give birth. Luke does not say how long they have been in Bethlehem before she does give birth, just simply that when she arrives, during those days, she gave birth. Think about how difficult this was for her. She was away from home, away from family support, away from familiar surroundings, away from creature comforts, away from a midwife, away from attendants. Mary was all alone. She does everything in this by herself. In fact, not to get ahead of myself, but look at verse 7 just for a moment. She gave birth. She wrapped him in cloths. She laid him in a manger. She doesn't even have a nurse or an attendant to, to come alongside of her to help her as she is giving birth virtually alone by herself. There were no angels. There were no trumpets blaring. No fanfare. This is the kind of person whom God always uses. Not an excuse maker. Not someone who has to be coddled. Not someone who has to have the circumstances just right before they want to step into the movement of ministry. No, this is the kind of person whom God uses that in times of difficulty, when there is a price to pay in serving God, it is people like this who step forward and say, by the grace of God, I'm all in. This is whom God uses. People who are morally pure who resist temptation, who pursue holiness, who live in obedience to God. Though out of the public eye, like Mary was, and though out of the spotlight, the person whom God uses is faithful when no one else is around. This person is faithful when no one is looking. This person is faithful when it would be easy to cut corners. This person is faithful when standing in the gap 
and no one is there even to uphold your arms. This was Mary. And this is the person whom God has always used. I want you to note fifth and finally, the lowly Jesus, verse 7. At last, this story reaches the very bottom rung. Here is the birth of a baby in an out-of-the-way place by a scorned teenage girl engaged to an unknown nobody carpenter. This is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never a passage or a text more greatly illustrates how God has confounded the wise and the powerful of this world with those who are weak and are virtually unknown by the populace. Look at verse 7. It's stated in just such simple, straightforward language. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. Please note it does not say her only son. Her firstborn son, which clearly implies, as other passages teach, that she would give birth to other children. We read in John chapter 7 how Jesus had brothers that urged him to go up and present himself in Jerusalem. Show yourself. No, Jesus was merely the firstborn of several that she would bear. But this child was different in that this child was sired not by Joseph, but by God the Holy Spirit who has created life in the womb of Mary. This son to whom she gives birth has been in her womb for the last nine months. He has been growing and developing within her like any other human. Though he is without a sin nature and without any sin, he nevertheless is developing within Mary. He is totally dependent upon her for everything inside the womb and then outside the womb. We read, having given birth, she wrapped him in cloths. Now, these cloths were strips of fabric applied for warmth. Some have suggested in order to keep his limbs straight and to give the feeling, the snug feeling of, of the womb. She knew to do what needed to be done. She wrapped him in in cloths. Note again, it was she who did this. There was no one there to help. And Joseph probably was like many men and of little help in a time like this. And she clothed him with cloths, this one who would clothe her with his own perfect righteousness. And then laid him in a manger. She did this. She didn't hand him to a nurse or a midwife who then in turn tucked him into a manger. She is doing this all on her own, all by herself. She's on a mission and she knows what this mission is for the angel has told her who this child is. She laid him in a manger. And this word manger is a Greek word that means really a feeding trough. In fact, the Holman Bible, a recent translation, an excellent translation of the Scriptures, actually translates manger as feeding trough, for that is what it, it was. It would serve as a cradle or a, or a basket for, for Jesus. Um, caravans, as they were coming to... Bethlehem, in order to register for the census, they were swarming in and no doubt had arrived earlier than Joseph and Mary did for their travel was probably somewhat slower and, and more deliberate 
And as these caravans now fill this tiny little town of, of Bethlehem, there is an abundance of animals, uh, camels, donkeys, horses, whatever, that have, have brought the travelers there to register. And so there is a need for the use of a, of a feeding trough. And as Mary looks around where to place the child that has been born, the baby, the infant, she laid him in a, in a manger, a feeding trough. Where she actually was, we're, we're not told. She could have been in a barn. She could have been in a stable. She could have been in a stall. Uh, she could have been in a cave. Uh, she could have simply been in an open space with, with curtains that have been raised to separate the animals, a, a makeshift place just out in the open, which well may be the case. And now here is Jesus being laid in this manger, in this feeding trough, smelly, filthy, cold. I'm telling you, this is as low a posture as any human being could be upon the earth. And the contrast from verse 1 could not be any greater. The first potentate of the Roman Empire. And now the Lord Jesus Christ laid in a feeding trough in a tiny little town. We're given the reason by Luke because there was no room for them in the inn. Historically, the inn has been pictured as kind of a bed and breakfast type of place. And it's possible that it could be a precursor to something like that. But this word is also translated elsewhere in Luke as a guest room. And the word was used in other literature of something that would be like a hostel or a, simply a shelter. This could be anything from the equivalent of a tiny little house to a, a lean-to shelter for animals and people just to lay on the ground under it. The city was bulging with travelers pouring into this little town because Caesar Augustus has spoken and they come sprinting into Bethlehem. But as they arrive, the city was so full with other people that there was no place for them. How fitting all of this was for Christ, who when he came, it says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. How fitting that he came as he did because, as Philippians 2 says, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and was made in the likeness of men. How fitting is this entire picture for the one who, did, who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. How fitting is this picture for one who knew no sin that God would make to be sin for us, that he would bear the filth and bear the depravity and bear the corruption of his people. How fitting it is that in his entrance into this world, there would be, in reality, a picture of what he came to do. The world looks at these verses and sees the greatness of Caesar, 
is impressed with the Caesars of this world, men who but speak and people are sent into motion, people who stand at the head of institutions and organizations and, and corporations who have risen to the top, who command great authority as they speak. But the truth of the Word of God is the greatness is found in the one who humbles himself and who gives himself for the good and for the service of others. And that is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing here by his incarnation, by the virgin birth and his entrance into this world. And it is a demonstration to us that the greatest among you shall be the servant of all and that by his humble posture he has come to give himself a ransom for many. And so as I come to the end of, of this message, I want to ask you, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, do you know him in your heart and in your soul? Have you come to put your faith and your trust in him? For there is no salvation in any other name except in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, call upon him. Tell him what a sinner you are. Tell him how you have failed in life. Tell him how you have fallen short of his glory. He receives sinners. He has come not for the righteous. He has come for those who are in need of the physician. He has come to heal the incurable sin of sickness, the sickness of sin and of death. If you have never believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, why would you hesitate? Why would you remain in your filth? Why would you remain where you are when one so glorious and one so mighty to save is being offered to you? If you would but receive him by faith this very moment, he would take you in. And this one who was born in such lowly conditions, you too would have a lowly birth. And you too would be born again from above. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, I urge you, to believe upon him this second, this very moment. And if you die without Christ, you have no one to blame but yourself. For those of us who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, let us not be preoccupied with the Caesar Augustuses of the world. Let us have our gaze and our focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us look to Christ. Let us look to him and live. And we will find in Christ all of the grace and all of the mercies that we so desperately need.